Today I am here in Studio B at Milan Recording Studios and I wanted to show you guys the array of musical instruments that we have here that fall into the family of idiophones. Now idiophones are a group of musical instruments whose sound is produced by bars of various materials, sometimes metal, sometimes wood, and in some cases I've heard of idiophones being made of glass and stuff like that, but we don't have anything crazy like that. We have a glockenspiel, a marimba, a vibraphone, and a xylophone. And I wanted to talk to you about the various differences between these instruments and why they are all rather similar, but also very different. Now before I get around to talking about that, I wanted to thank Musser very, very much for sending this really awesome banner. This kind of came in the mail the other day as kind of a house, uh, uh, housewarming gift uh, for starting up uh, Milan Recording Studios. And it's a really awesome banner. I love the way it looks. It's just really awesome. And as you can see down here, it says legendary mallet percussion, which is very, very true. Uh, Musser makes the world's greatest marimba and vibraphone. And this, I love the M500 so much. It's so much fun to play. It has such a warm, rich, full sound. It's absolutely incredible. So at the end of this video, when I get around to talking about the marimba, I will, sh I will play a little bit on it and let you hear how wonderful it actually sounds. But first, I wanted to start off with the smallest member of the idiophone family that we have here at Milan Recording Studios. Now, this is a glockenspiel. Now, glockenspiels can come in a few different sizes and shapes. Sometimes they come in a lyre-shaped uh, little, not a case, but like a lyre-shaped frame. And then those ones are usually used in marching bands. And I believe they hold them I think like this, or maybe like this, or some way, and then they can actually, there's a little frame that hooks onto the body, and then you can play it when you're walking down the street, and those are used in marching bands. This one here is not used in marching bands, and it's a very, very simple design. It's got wood on the back, and on the back, it says simply Japan. So I have no idea of a make or manufacturer of it, but I do know it was made in Japan, and I do know it has a very, very nice sound to it. The mallets that come with this one are simple, and they have a little, they have two ends. One of them is a softer rubber, and one of them is a harder rubber compound. Now, glockenspiel can also be used with plastic mallets, and sometimes I think even metal mallets, I have seen some that have um, plastic and metal mallets. And the plastic mallets have a really, really bright sound that by itself is honestly very annoying to listen to because it's incredibly loud, and the, the xylophone, I mean, sorry, the glockenspiel has a very, very high pitch to it. And so you can imagine with a harder mallet than this, it would be really, really loud. But the reason that you'd use plastic mallets on a instrument like this is if you're in a marching band and you've got all kinds of brass instruments which are really loud, the glockenspiel would really need to be hit very hard with very hard mallets to make it be able to be heard. I'm going to play a little bit on this glockenspiel for you as well, just some few chords and stuff. And you can actually hear that there is a difference between the soft side and the hard side. And then the hard side is like this. So you can definitely hear that there is a, a difference, and I really like the sound of the softer side, to be honest with you. Now, on the very top end of this instrument, you would want to use the harder side mallets, but I was already on the soft side, so that's why I was playing them. Now, this is a two-octave instrument. It goes from A up to this A and then up to this A as well, so it is simply a two-octave instrument, and it is very small. And the main difference between a glockenspiel and an instrument such as, say, a xylophone is the fact that this uses metal bars, as you can see here, and as I said, when you flip it over, you can see that the bars are indeed made of metal. And an interesting little detail I wanted to touch on is the fact that the maker of this glockenspiel actually kind of scraped away at the bottom of the bars to fine-tune the pitch and to make it very, um, to make the pitch very precise, and I, I imagine that's why they did it. Musser does this on their instruments, and this manufacturer did it on this little xylophone as well. I mean, this little glockenspiel as well. And as you can see, that is what was done there. So now I just mentioned the xylophone there by mistake, but now let's go take a look at the xylophone, which in many ways is very similar to the glockenspiel. And in fact, many people confuse them. I used the wrong term there, but many people actually confuse the xylophone with the glockenspiel for a number of different reasons. A, they are very, very similar indeed, but also I've heard that many children's toys, which are in fact glockenspiels because they have metal bars, were marketed as xylophones back in the day and probably even still today. So that is another reason why there's actually a lot of confusion between the glockenspiel and the xylophone. So now, let's go check out the xylophone. So this little instrument right here is a xylophone, and this was made by Jenko. There is a Jenko logo right up here, and I've actually already done a video on it where I play this instrument along with one of my loops I was working on, and today I wanted to include it with the rest of these instruments to show you why it is different. 
Now, as you can see here, we do not have metal bars. In fact, we have wood bars. These are rosewood bars, and they have a very, very nice sound to them indeed. And, but you can probably tell that the sound does not resonate very long. When I hit the bars, the lowest notes have a little bit of sustain to them. But in fact, the notes do not resonate very long. And that is what separates the xylophone apart from an instrument such as the marimba, because they both have wooden keys, but th the lack of sustain and the very small range of the xylophone is one reason that sets it apart from the marimba. The other reason that a xylophone is different from a marimba is the way it's played. T typically, xylophones are played with only two mallets, like I have here. Sometimes people will use four. But typically, xylophones are only played with two. And also, typically, people use very hard mallets, such as plastic, and sometimes Sometimes even metal, which I don't advise because you can dent the um, you can dent the bars, which is not very good. But sometimes people will use metal, but typically plastic mallets are used. Sometimes wooden ones as well. Now the reason, similar to the glockenspiel, why harder mallets are used on an instrument like this is because it would be part of an orchestra. And again, you'd have brass instruments, you'd have string instruments, you'd have a piano in there, and the xylophone would have to cut through all of that and be able to be heard. So that's why you'd use really, really hard mallets. These are the hardest yarn mallets that I have, and uh, maybe sometime I'll pick up some plastic ones or something. But um, the wooden or plastic mallets have a really, really bright sound, kind of like the glockenspiel. And by itself, it's not the greatest thing to listen to. So yarn mallets like this are very, very pleasing. Another thing that makes the xylophone a lot different from an instrument such as the marimba, while there are different sizes of both xylophones and marimbas, generally xylophones are much smaller than marimbas. This instrument right here weighs 35 pounds. The marimba back there weighs 350. So this particular marimba weighs 10 times the amount of this particular xylophone, which I think is kind of funny. Another thing that's kind of interesting about this particular xylophone is that, in fact, it can fold up. And on my side here, there's actually a little carrying handle. So you can fold up the legs, pick it up by the handle, and just walk around with it. And one thing, uh, one other thing that separates the xylophone from the marimba is generally, and some xylophones will have resonator tubes, but on this particular instrument and on many uh, xylophones, there are no resonating tubes underneath. As you can see, the bars simply just are there and there are no resonating tubes to help make the instrument louder. Now again, some xylophones will have resonator tubes, but since the range is so much, um, it's, it's much higher pitched than most of the marimba is, the resonator tubes would be very short very much like the resonator tubes on the high end of the marimba will be. So that is one way to tell the difference between a xylophone and a marimba. The, the xylophone will be very, very small and will also be very high pitched. It will not have all of the low bass notes that a marimba has. So I think that's about everything for the xylophone. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And now let's talk about the instrument that is right here, which again is similar but also different. Now this instrument that I'm standing in front of is a vibraphone, and there's a few things that make the vibraphone different from any of the instruments we have talked about. Now, similarly to the glockenspiel, the vibraphone does have metal bars. As you can see, they're gold colored, and also when I hit them, you will definitely hear that they are definitely metal. They have an incredible amount of sustain, and they have a really, really beautiful sound. Now, I'm using somewhat hard mallets here. These are the uh, Musser M9 mallets, and they have a very bright sound. Particularly up here in the treble. I honestly prefer the sound of these mallets over here with the vibraphone, but I just wanted to use these to give you an idea that if you use different hardness mallets, like again with the glockenspiel, I demonstrated that too. If you use different hardness mallets, you can get a different sound. So again, this, as compared to, let me put these away, as compared to this. It's much softer, it's much more delicate, it's much more gentle, and it has a really, really beautiful sound. Now again, you'd want to use the harder mallets for the treble and the softer mallets for the bass end of the instrument, such as maybe this. Something kind of like that, but it's that it's just a quick demonstration of the sound and also the way the different hardness mallets can give you a different sound. Now, like I said, there's a few different things that make the, uh, the vibraphone different from any of the other instruments we've talked about. And one of those differences is the fact that this has a pedal. As I mentioned to you earlier, this instrument has an incredible amount of sustain. And if I just let that go, it would probably last for 
a minute or two minutes before it finally died down and stopped making sound. So if there were no dampers, you literally couldn't play this instrument at all. So that is why there is a damper on vibraphones. As you can see, there is a really, really huge, it's like an oversized piano pedal. It's absolutely massive and it's a lot of fun to step on. And then it controls this very simple bar here that runs along underneath the, uh, the bars and simply is a piece of felt that then when you, when you let go of the pedal, it rises up and as you can see, it even moves the bars to prevent them from ringing out. So if you hit the instrument when the damper is up, It's a really fun percussive sound and it's very, very interesting and it can be used also in music as well. And of course you can push the damper down, have the bar go away, and then you can uh, really use that really warm, full, beautiful resonant sound. One thing that really sets the vibraphone apart from other instruments in this family is the pulsator discs that can be found inside of the resonator tubes. As you can see here, underneath all of the bars, you can see a little disc that is rotating underneath. And basically what's that, what that's doing is opening and closing the resonator tube and therefore increasing and decreasing the amount of ampli amplification that the bars have. So if I switch that off and just play a chord like I was earlier. You can hear the sound is very even. Now if I switch that off, I mean, if I turn on the pulsator discs and play that same uh, F major chord. Hear that? Isn't that awesome? The sound pulsates and it has a vibrato and that is where the term vibraphone comes from. Not only do the bars vibrate to give you the sound, but you also have vibrato with the pulsator discs to give you a sound, uh, to give you the vibrato sound. Now, what's really cool is over here, there's actually an adjustment. There's a power switch as well as a speed adjustment. And so you can really make those things go spinning quickly. And it's absolutely funny how fast they can go. And then you can do something kind of cool where you can like, you can have them spinning at the fastest speed and then just gently dial that down and it has a really cool sound to it as well. I like that sound. That's really neat. And of course you can have the pulsator discs spinning very, very slowly as well. just like that. And so it really gives a, a much different sound to the vibraphone and it makes it sound really awesome. And it's one of my favorite features about the vibraphone is the pulsator discs that give it that awesome vibro sound. So finally, I'm going to talk about the instrument that you all have probably been waiting for. This is the M500 Concert Grand Marimba made by Musser, and it truly is a legendary mallet percussion instrument. It's an absolutely phenomenal instrument. It's a total beast. I love how it plays. It's so wonderful. It has a, a wonderful, warm, gentle, thick, resonant bass. And then there are the rest of the instrument, the entire instrument really just sings, even all the way up into the very highest treble notes to the very, very lowest bass notes. The entire thing is absolutely wonderful. Now, since we're doing a comparison between all these instruments, I thought I'd talk about some of the things that make this different from the instruments we've talked about, and also a couple of the things that make this Musser instrument unique to some of the other brands out there that I know of. Um, one of the things that makes this Musser instrument unique is the J tubes that you can see. If you look down at the resonator tubes, you can see that they're all, they, all of them aren't straight. Some of them actually curve around, and that's because the resonator tube is matched to the pitch of the bar, and some of these pitches are so low that the bar, I mean, the resonator tube would have to be really long. So to make it really long, they loop it around and it makes that J shape and that's why those are called the J tubes. There's another other interesting thing on the J tubes and some of the other resonator tubes as well. And that is the little tuning cap that you'll see on the end there. As you can see, there is a cap. You can see it on those resonator tubes as well. And you can see there's a little cap. And what you can do is you can actually turn this and uh, you can turn it all the way around. And what you can do with that is you can actually very finely adjust the length of the resonator tube and that can amplify and um, de-amplify the resonator um, in the bar. So if you have a bar that doesn't have very much sustain and it happens to have one of these caps on it, you can actually turn that a bit and then you can actually bring out the tone of that bar or make it a little less uh, pro prominent if it has too much sustain and it sounds way too boomy for the room you're in, which I think is a really nice feature. I kind of wish all of them had that, but the reason that the, they all of them don't is because the, I assume the caps are sometimes on the inside of the resonator tube and then you wouldn't be able to uh, touch the 
cap because the little cap that actually determines the length of the tube is kind of inside there. I think that's why there's not a resonator tube on all of them. And also because a lot of the higher end, because they're so small and they're so short, they don't have a whole lot of sustain. If I find these hard mallets up here and I play some of the treble notes, Their very, very highest notes do not have a lot of sustain simply because of how small they are, but you'll see that a lot of the rest of the instrument has a lot of sustain. Now what's kind of funny is to me that the, the, the marimba, this particular one, actually goes up a little bit higher than the xylophone does. The xylophone ends at this F, and this instrument actually goes up a little bit higher than that. Which is kind of funny, but again, the difference between the xylophone and the marimba is because the xylophone doesn't have all of this. The xylophone, I think, starts at this note, and I think it does. Yeah, I think it starts at this one and then goes up to this F, but the bars are so much smaller than on here, it's a much more compact instrument, but this instrument has all of these notes down here. Now, something else that makes the Musser instrument a bit more unique than many of the other instruments on the market is the width of these bars. And I want to demonstrate just a little bit how wide these bars truly are. I'm going to set those down there. Now, if I take these two mallets and I play a fifth down here in the bass between C and G, as you can see, that is a fifth. And if I take that same spread and I go all the way back up to the treble here, and starting on C, now I am playing an octave. So that is how that's how big these bass bars are compared to the treble bars, that this same stretch is an octave in the treble and a fifth down here. And you can hear that the bass in this instrument is absolutely wonderful and I love it. And I'll play some chords on it and give you a bit of a better demonstration. But the reason this instrument has such awesome bass is because of the width of these bars, they can really resonate and they really have a beautiful sound. Many of the many of Musser's other competitors do not make wide bars down here. And the, it, the reason that they don't is because you do have to compensate for the width of the bars down here compared to the somewhat more narrowness of them as they go up the instrument. You do kind of have to compensate for that, but I'm not finding it to be all that much of a challenge, especially if you start off with an instrument like this and uh, you just you start learning how to play it on an instrument like this. I don't find it to be that hard of a challenge, but I believe that's why many of the other companies do not do that. But honestly, the Muster Marimba just has such a phenomenal bass sound down here. It's absolutely wonderful and it's one of my favorite things about this instrument. So as I said, I'll give you a little bit of a sound demonstration of this instrument as well. I will play some more chords up in this region of the instrument and I'll also go down a little bit into the bass as well. And hopefully you enjoy just a little impromptu performance on the Musser M500 Marimba to give you an idea of what this awesome instrument sounds like. I absolutely love the sound of these bass. I said that like four times by now, but I just love the sound of these bass bars so much. They're absolutely phenomenal. swells and it really resonates and it's really, really awesome. Now I'm quite familiar with the piano and so therefore I have an understanding of how this instrument works, but I'm still working on the technique and as I get better at it, I'm going to be learning more and more complicated pieces and it might, it might be kind of fun to see what different, what music written for the piano or say written for the organ might sound like 
but played on the marimba. And if I get good enough to be able to play the marimba that well, I might do videos like that in the future. So if that sounds kind of interesting, you might want to think about subscribing. And if you do that, thank you very much. And you also might want to check out my channel because I've got videos specifically on the marimba and specifically on the vibraphone talking again about the details of the instruments and what makes them different. So if you want to just see a video about the vibraphone, you could do that. Or also if you want to see videos about pianos and organs and all kinds of other cool keyboard instruments, you might want to go check out my channel and check that out. So if you do that, I'll see you in the next video and goodbye.